everybody. Welcome to Alternative Investments, Crypto Safety Standards. I'm your host from Inside.com, Stephanie Zielinski, and we have some incredible speakers lined up today who are going to help us learn about how new crypto investing platforms, services, and investment vehicles are making crypto investing safer and more accessible for retail investors like you and me. We are going to hear from Jody Gunsberg of Coindesk, Elena Nadalo. Linsky from Ironfish, Nick Percoco from Kraken, and Georgi Kazaradzi from Oryx. Since today's event is about investing, got to give that disclaimer, um, Inside.com is providing this info for educational purposes only. It's not intended to be investment advice. Make sure you go to a licensed professional for investment advice and always DYOR, do your own research. Before we get to our guests, I want to quickly tell you about Inside.com. We have a brand new social news site. You can go to Inside.com now and join over 10,000 early users who are reading and talking about topics that interest them. In fact, those topics are the same topics of our newsletters. We have over 14 that cover the worlds of business, tech, venture capital, and crypto. Um, you can sign up for those at Inside.com. And of course, we are bringing you wonderful informative events like this every week for free. Our goal is always to help make you smarter, more successful, and build your network. So in the spirit of building our network and building community, please introduce yourself. We would love to know who you are, where you are, what you do. If you are watching this event live streaming on inside.com right now, you can head to the comment section there and um, tell us who you are. We would also really love for you to bring us your questions for our guests. In the first um, hour, we're going to hear some wonderful presentations from our guests. In the second hour, we will bring them your questions for group Q&A. 
Finally, really big thank you to our sponsor today. Oryx is our sponsor. They are a leading crypto software ecosystem. They offer um, traders, investors, and institutions a suite of tools that make DeFi easy, which is something that we all want. Um, their co-founder and CEO, Georgi, is going to speak to us today about DeFi and security. You guys go to at Get Oryx on Twitter, you know, Tweet them, at them, give them some love, um, follow them. We're very grateful um, for them to sponsor this event. Without sponsors like them, we um, cannot bring you these events for free. All right, so let's explore our topic. We are going to hear a quick overview of crypto safety from Karan Shafeker. He is a business management consultant and the writer of the Venture Capital Newsletter here at Inside.com. Welcome, Karan. Hey, Stephanie. Nice to be here. Is he here? Maybe. Yes. First, a warm I'm welcome to all the panelists. Presentation who are here. Because uh, we have an extremely the amazing graphics. lineup. And, uh, and a huge welcome to the audience as well, wherever you are tuned in from. We hope you enjoy this show today. So, cryptocurrency has been the talk of the town, and we have seen interest in this. Uh, peak since 2017 and really go to a different level in 2021, where we had a lot of people inquiring about cryptocurrency. In fact, as per our research, 86% of Americans are aware about cryptocurrency and 16% of them have actually invested in, in them. So, and I'm pretty sure why, while there have been 16% who have invested, there are many who, are, who want to invest in this and uh, they just, don't know what other steps to take or they are maybe a bit precautious about the, the hacks and the other news that are there about cryptocurrency. Uh, nevertheless, cryptocurrency is growing day by day in, um, in volume and we can see it mark, its market cap in fact touched $2.8 trillion late last year in November. In fact, as of this week, it averages around $1.7 trillion. So that's a huge amount of trading that's happening on cryptocurrency and people are surely getting more and more interested as the day goes by. In fact, daily trades hit $500 billion on a single day in May. And uh, in this week itself, we find a daily trading averaging at around $94 billion in a 24-hour window. So that is, that is good. And that is mainly derived by the the popularity of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm pretty sure many of the people in the audience today as, as well have heard or may, maybe they've already invested in Bitcoin. You know, and Bitcoin really hit its stride last year, you know, topping at around sixty thousand dollars last year. Well, the market is fluctuating and since we have seen it come down to thirty five thousand, but it's back at fifty thousand this week. So that that's a good this okay so to begin with why should you invest in cryptocurrency i mean what is the the benefit of in investing in cryptocurrency uh, we are we are seeing cryptocurrency especially bitcoin and ethereum being stores of value they are maintaining their value and it's estimated that their value is going to keep rising you know they are inflation resistant because there is a scarcity coded into the factor of the which means that you know bitcoin will stop mining for example at 21 million you know so the demand is always going to be there but the supply is going to be very restricted so that's why it's going to maintain its value and it's going to be inflation resistant uh, then it also facilitates an peer to peer uh, decentralized transaction you know so you bypass all the banks and the fees that other service providers usually levy on us uh, what are the other benefits of crypto well it also comes can help in international aid sometimes where people have gathered in recent times, you know, give aid to certain countries. Finally, we can also get many unbanked people who don't have bank accounts or who don't have any such things because of a lack of credit or something, and we can get them into the system as well. You know? And uh, while cryptocurrency has seen it, uh, this, we have also seen many hacks in recent times. And, I mean, hackers stole $3.2 billion worth of cryptocurrency in 2021. And this year alone, we are seeing $1.3 billion. And while that 
amount and the hacks are like for example axie infinity hack of 625 million dollars that seems like an ex- exaggerated amount it's very small and very marginal when you compare the actual amount of cryptocurrency that's in uh, circulation you know uh, nevertheless i think lots of these platforms and uh, various uh, crypto maker i mean bitcoin chains are also incorporating a lot of precautionary measures uh, a lot of safety features into their system uh, we we are seeing two factor authentication as uh, like a standard set across all the major crypto platforms you know uh, then we are seeing wallets you know cold wallets which are thumb drive based wallets where you can really secure your amount and be you know a bit tension free about the hacks and all that and if you go to choose for an online wallet we are seeing even increasing advancements in that as well where all these platforms are really increasing their security in um, terms of the online wallet so they are also getting safer uh, day by day uh, in terms of the other proactive measures that uh, these plat- platforms are taking they are take doing security audits regularly on their platform so they are constantly analyzing what's the security parameters of of these uh, platforms you know and all the highest top rated um, security platforms always get the triple a rating and so on and so forth they are also incorporating many bug bounty programs so that you have penetration specialist and all the other members of the audience who can try and identify bugs on these platform and highlight it to these platforms you know, in in lieu of a re- reward and last but not the least in case it is hacked we are we are witnessing that some of these platforms also have their own treasuries you know so in case your account is hacked so there is some chance of at least getting your money back sky mavis for example the one behind axie infinity has a treasury about 1.6 billion dollars you know and they are going to reimburse all the people all the victims of the axie infinity hack so we are witnessing a lot of um, changes and a lot of developments on, on this platform and uh, I'm, i'm pretty sure we have a lot to talk about with uh, our guest today so back to you sefni great thank you karan we sure do have a lot to talk about and i'm really excited to start with jody gunsberg she's the managing director of coindesk and coindesk is a leading news site specializing in bitcoin and digital currencies i love coindesk i think they are such a great source of information about crypto so um let me invite jody to the stage we're excited to hear from you Thank you for your kind introduction. Um good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today to learn more about how investing in cryptocurrency, uh specifically Bitcoin, can be beneficial for your portfolio. And you'll see today how unique Bitcoin is as an asset class and how digital assets are um different from other assets and We'll also talk about how attractive they can be despite their high volatility. Uh we'll show you how they can improve your portfolio diversification and we'll talk a little bit about how the macro factors like the dollar, interest rates and inflation impact Bitcoin. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the major risks and how to manage those risks. So let's start with the de- definition of crypto as an asset class. So there's no really well accepted definition of an asset class, but here's two pretty um generally used frameworks. So one is a super asset classes that has been developed by Pimco and Ibitson where assets are broken up into three major categories. So first is super um the capital assets the second is consumable or transformable assets and the third are the store of value assets. Now, with the capital assets, these are things a lot of us know, things like stocks, bonds, real estate, they generate great income. The consumable assets are like commodities and the store of value assets, they don't generate income. You don't use them to produce other goods and services necessarily, but they do have a value things like currency and fine art. And until crypto really gold was the only asset that had spanned more than one of these super asset classes gold sits in the second and third and now with crypto um bitcoin 
while it is a store of value, Ether is totally innovative. It's truly uh, the first asset of its kind ever, really, to sit in all three of these super asset classes. Um, Ether is a capital asset as you own uh, fees from part of the global settlement layer. You've got the consumable, transformable part where uh, ETH is burnt for every computational step on Ethereum. And ETH can be used as a currency. You can use it for uh, lending and digital assets. So that's really interesting about cryptocurrency. Second framework is of beta or market exposures. That's a more quantitative framework where we generally use things like interest rates, volatility, credit spreads. Um, in this case, we use correlations is a highly defining factor of a unique asset classes. And as we'll see, that Bitcoin and crypto are generally uncorrelated with other assets. So what, what is cryptocurrency? It's a group of digital assets where the transactions are secured and verified using cryptography. So this is nothing new. Cryptography is a form of encoding and decoding. It's been around since the ancient um, Egyptian hieroglyphics, at least. And those transactions are often stored on computers distributed all over the world via a distributed ledger technology called blockchain. Neither of these things, cryptography or blockchain, are entirely new, but this combination of the two, which makes the crypto uh, secure, verifiable, and immutable, is what makes it unique and valuable. So what represents crypto as an asset class? We've got the Coindesk Digital Large Cap Index. Uh, it's a market cap weighted index of the largest digital assets, very similar in nature to the S&P 500, where you've got a market cap weighted index that represents the asset class. And what you can see is that it's highly concentrated in Bitcoin and Ether. Together, they make up over about 90 percent. The um, characteristic of the high concentration is not unique, even in the S&P 500, which is a fully developed market you have very high concentrations now of technology and the FANG stocks. Um, I would expect as the digital assets evolve that more assets will come in and the weights to Bitcoin and ETH will start to diminish a little bit. So what has been so attractive? Well, simply it's the returns. Uh, these, I put them all on the same axis on purpose and you can see it that it's just astounding how high the returns have been. This goes back to 2014 when uh, we first have the Bitcoin price. This is of the Coindesk Bitcoin price index. That's the longest running Bitcoin index supporting over 75% of the assets in the space. And over this entire time period, you can see the blue line that's Bitcoin just makes everything else look flat line. And here's the numbers underneath. So again, you know, you can just see that returns from Bitcoin are astounding compared with the other assets. And even in the last year, Bitcoin's outperformed the stock market by 30%. But that comes with extra volatility, extra risk. So on average, annualized, you've got volatility of Bitcoin around 80%. You've got stocks uh, around 15%. But the volatility coming from Bitcoin is not unheard of kind of volatility. Uh, what we can see here is that the low volatility of Bitcoin around 15% is actually more like the average volatility of stocks and the average volatility of Bitcoin, this is here in the green circle, 67% is still well under the high volatility of the S&P 500. So again, as this asset class emerges and evolves, and there's more uh, institutional adoption, we'll start to see that volatility come down. But we do get paid for that risk. So we measure that by the sharp ratio. That's a measure of risk adjusted return. And the sharp ratio for Bitcoin is 1.44 versus 1.28 on the S&P 500. So it's important to know that while it's risky, those very high returns more than compensate you for those units of risk. And not only do you get that uh, compensation, but you get a diversification benefit here over the whole time period. You see that there's very little correlation of Bitcoin to any of the assets. It's near zero um, across the board here. 
And, you know, people will often say correlation depends on the time period you pick. Uh, so I'm showing you the highs, the lows, the averages, 30 day rolling correlation, even on the high side, 0.77. That's a pretty high correlation. Um, it's it's moderately high. It still leaves a little extra room for diversification benefit. Um, it's a lot lower than the kinds of correlations you'll see in between uh, most equities that are more like in the 0.9 range. So uh, again, you know, even on average rolling through the time periods, you've got near zero correlations and there's some room for diversification. Uh, that said, uh, while it has been as high as 0.77, it's not that high now. While it's rising, it's closer to between 0.4 and 0.5, which I would consider moderate. It's been higher in the past. I think it's been rising because of the uh, quantitative easing and tightening that we've been experiencing. But, you know, when you boil it down to past correlation and you just look at, you know, days that are up or down, Bitcoin is only down uh, on 50% of the days that the S&P 500 is down and it's um, up 58% of the days when the S&P 500 is positive. So they're really not perfectly correlated. And what this does is it helps improve the portfolio efficiency. So if we start with a 60-40 stock bond mix, take 10% out of equities and put it into Bitcoin, what we find is we increase our returns annualized by 10%, which is... Uh, great, you know, but we also increase our risk. We increase our risk from about 8.7 to 12.3, which does make the portfolio more efficient. We add 0.4 onto the sharp ratio from 0.9 up to 1.4, which is uh, a big increase in the portfolio efficiency. That's very attractive. So now let's talk a little bit about how the macroeconomics impact Bitcoin and other assets. Uh, we'll start with the dollar. I think because Bitcoin is priced in dollars, all else equal, that relationship is inverse. So as the dollar falls, Bitcoin will rise. As the dollar rises, Bitcoin will fall, all else equal. Um, we can see here on average that as the dollar drops, Bitcoin has returned about 58%. And as the dollar rises, uh, it acts as a headwind, but Bitcoin was still positive about 16% on average for every 1% the dollar rose. So, you know, that's just because the growth of the technology and innovation has been more powerful than the dollar. But the dollar is pretty much at all time highs now. So wouldn't be surprised to see that come down a little bit, especially if some of the tensions between Russia and Ukraine ease, um, you know, in times of war, that makes the dollar strong. So maybe we'll see that come down a little bit. Uh, also, we're hearing a lot about rising interest rates. So rising interest rates in themselves are not bad for Bitcoin. They're actually pretty good. Um, but if they rise moderately, that's better than if they rise too quickly or, or, you know, with big increases. So right now we're more towards the big increase side than the moderate side. So we'd like to see that rise a little more slowly. Um, again, it's not a bad thing for Bitcoin if they rise really fast, um, still outperforms other assets, but it's better if the increases are a little bit more moderate. And uh, with inflation too, and you know, again, all of this data needs to be taken with a grain of salt. We only have eight years of data here, but um, with inflation, uh, moderately low inflation is the best environment for Bitcoin. Right now, we're at a period of high inflation. Uh, this data ended uh, December 2021. So we see now we're even in inflation higher than the range goes. But what the good news is that if it's that high, hopefully we'll start to see it decelerate a little bit. And if it decelerates, even if it's positive, the decelerating inflation is good for Bitcoin. Um, and then we use a measure called inflation beta to sensitivity of the asset to inflation. And uh, we can see a very high inflation beta with Bitcoin for every 1% rise in CPI, we see on average 42% return with Bitcoin, which is far more than equities and even four times more than commodities, which has been known for the greatest inflation hedge. Um, so with a very small allocation to Bitcoin, you can get a very strong uh, inflation protection. 
So we'll finish it up with some of the risks. What are the risks? The three major risks are the market risk, the technology risk, and the regulatory risk. These are not unique to crypto, even though they are the main drivers of risk in crypto. Market risk is just the adoption that faces any new technology. Um, the technology risk is the risk that the technology breaks. And the regulatory risk, which is, receives most of the attention, um, is least well understood, but it's really uh, needed. We need regulatory clarity in order to build the infrastructure for the large institutions to comply. So we're watching that. Um, and it's pretty unpredictable in many cases. So that's a big risk. But again, um, one of the major risks that is not unique to crypto, but lives in any emerging asset or new asset is the lack of data. So when we look at any of these nut models, the metrics, we've got to remember to think qualitatively as well and understand the stories because there's not a lot of data to work with here. So what can we do to manage this risk? There's really two um, ways. One uh, is in the hands of the industry. We need more regulatory clarity because we need to know the rules in order to play the game. We need better infrastructure for the institutions to be compliant, and we need the derivatives market to be deeper in order to manage these risks. If these things happen, we should see that volatility come down. From the investor's perspective, what can we do to manage the risk? Well, we can limit the investment, so keep it to you know small, under 5%, 2.5% we see typically, um, but it's speculative, so remember that. Uh, diversify beyond Bitcoin. Now there's, oh, who knows? 10,000 plus digital assets out there. Uh, there's many that you can invest in to diversify your risk across Bitcoin. So uh, that's one way to manage that risk. Do your homework, understand the protocols, understand what's inside products. If you see ETFs or you see derivatives, are they, do they have equities? Do they have futures contracts? How directly are they tied to the underlying digital assets is an important question for your portfolio diversification. Um, and then to manage the risk, you can look for managed volatility products, look for target vol products that will uh, help you to keep your risk in line with your equities or other alternatives, and then learn from credible sources. So with that, um, we've taken the effort to uh, produce a digital asset classification standard where we define the industries of the top 500 uh, digital assets by market cap. We have a full glossary of definitions of all of the industry, industry groups and sectors that you see here. And this is really important, not just for understanding the language, discussing, but um, understanding how to invest in these things. So, you know, for example, you might see Bitcoin drop as a currency, but gaming will hold up because no matter what the currency does, everybody loves still playing their video games. So, um, you know, take your time to learn about what are the industries and definitions of the digital assets ecosystem. So with that, I'll just wrap it up with a couple of takeaways. Um, one is that again, cryptocurrency is a section of digital assets emerging as an asset class, but it is showing signs of its place in a portfolio. Uh, it uses the encoding and decoding of cryptography that's been around a long time and blockchain technology that is not new. It's this combination that makes it so valuable with secured, verified and immutable transactions. Um, we can represent this with market cap weighted indices to show what is the asset class representation. And we can see the returns are high, the risk has been high, that we've been paid for taking that risk, and that it does improve portfolio efficiency with low correlations uh, across the board. Um, Bitcoin does best with the falling dollar, moderately rising interest rates and inflation. So this could be a pretty good environment for Bitcoin. The major risks are the market risk, the technology risk and the regulatory risk. We need more regulatory clarity in order to build infrastructure that complies with the regulations. And with that, I would say to manage your risk by learning from credible sources and understanding the industries that you're investing in. So um, I'll, I'll end it there and you can certainly reach out and ask any questions. Uh, here's my email address and I really look forward to hearing from you and thank you for joining today. 
Thank you, Jody. That was wonderful. I really love the emphasis on education. Always important to do your own homework. Um, we will really explore the regulatory risk when we get to the group Q&A. Um, I have one super quick follow-up question for you, Jody. You're talking about um, you know, future predictions a little bit. I know uh, there's a Coindesk editor that was like, I think Bitcoin will um, go to a million dollars a coin sometime uh -huh. after 2025. And you're yeah. saying like, hey, with inflation, this is a nice environment for um, for Bitcoin to do well with all this inflation. What's what's your kind of, you know, prediction on the future value of Bitcoin? Yeah, that That's an interesting observation. And, you know, if you kind of think of Bitcoin as a, a new currency or to support the world's um, GDP or, or economic activity. Yeah, maybe it's got to hit a million dollars with the limited supply out there. Um, what I would say is that the technology of Bitcoin with this crypto blockchain combo, that's incredibly powerful. But already you've seen new technologies, even Ether, that has a transaction piece that's far more complex that can hold logical code that enables the entire DeFi system to be built off of it and, you know, all other industries. I would say about Bitcoin, um, it's a great start. I couldn't tell you if, you know, in the long run, Bitcoin will be the asset that is the main asset or the overtaking asset. Um, but that's why I encourage to invest across many, many assets to get exposure to that underlying infrastructure, because that I believe will hold value and grow and serve as the foundation for the industry going forward. So that's how I would think. Um, think about uh, AOL, like back from the tech bubble, right? Who, who, maybe who would have called that? So despite not knowing which one will be the winner, we know that the technology is probably going to do well. Yeah, good point. Thank you so much. We will keep talking about future outlooks when we have our group Q&A shortly. Um, the next guest that I want to introduce is Elena Natalinsky. Uh, yeah, Natalinsky. She has a background in software engineering. She's the founder and CEO of Ironfish, which is a layer one blockchain network with a focus on security, which is a big topic of conversation today. Welcome, Elena. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for, ha for having me. Should I share my screen? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. One sec. All right. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about Ironfish. Um, Ironfish is a privacy focused layer one project. Um, and uh, I want to give a quick kind of background on me. Uh, who, who am I to give this talk? Um, so I am a software engineer, um, started my career, uh, career at Microsoft. Um, and when I was at Airbnb, I started getting more and more involved with the Ethereum ecosystem and the crypto uh, ecosystem overall. Um, and uh, it's an, like an incredible industry, an incredible place. And I think people who get more and more involved with it um, realize that very quickly. Um, I think some people allude to this being like the beginning of the internet. Um, I'm not old enough to, to say <laughs> to, to say that, um, but it did definitely feel very special. Um, so uh, one of the first hackathons that I've been to, um, you know, everybody who was building on the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, they were all there. So Maker, for instance, was, was there, which is a major project. Vitalik, his dad was there. Um, the CryptoKitty is actually kind of launched uh, during that hackathon in, in 2017. Um, and so I started going uh, to more and more hackathons, eventually giving tutorials and talks um, to a point where kind of, uh, you know, I was still working full time as a software engineer at Airbnb and um, started kind of getting uh, pretty hard to do both. Um, and so I decided to join the crypto ecosystem full time. And the way I rationalized it is, what is the most impact impactful thing that I can do in the crypto ecosystem? Um, and the obvious thing to me was uh, to work on privacy. Um, and so the evolution of that thought process led to Ironfish, which is um, the project that um, you know, I'm working on uh, today. And 
Ironfish uh, is the universal privacy layer. Uh, we're building the universal privacy layer for, our, for, uh, for crypto. Um, so before we get into that, uh, so why work on a privacy product in crypto uh, in general? Um, and most people uh, don't know this, which is actually very surprising to me, but most cryptocurrencies are the least private way of transacting. Um, a cryptocurrency uh, by definition is this permanent public ledger for all of the transactions that have ever happened on it to be stored uh, you know, in, uh, indefinitely uh, for anyone to see. Um, and uh, I think like back in the day, you know, there was some misconception that Bitcoin was uh, anonymous um, and it's pseudonymous, meaning that yes, your full name is not associated with your wallet, um, but it's actually extremely easy to track. Uh, and you can look at every single account, every single wallet on Ethereum, Bitcoin, and uh, pretty much any other blockchain you can think of and get a really detailed uh, view of what that wallet actually has. Um, so here's an example. Um, so Etherscan, for instance, um, is what's called a block explorer. Um, and a block explorer simply indexes all the publicly available data that that blockchain has to offer. Um, you can click on any single wallet, look at any single transaction. Um, so this wallet, uh, this person, for instance, um, you know, is using Celsius network and it looks like they uh, use Binance. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can look at, um, you know, um, the, the Bitcoin uh, block explorer as well. And again, there are several. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin kind of is a bit less interesting to look at because they don't have smart contracts, uh, but you could trace exactly where each um, unspent transaction, which is kind of a fancy uh, word for saying like a, a bill. Um, you can look at all uh, the history for that bill um, uh, that originated uh, from it on Bitcoin. Uh, so for Ethereum or uh, an Etherscan, you can look at the wallet's historical balance even. Um, and these are very, very basic metrics that are just available on Etherscan today, but there are entire companies, uh, billion dollar companies that uh, their whole purpose is to give you more analytics as to what's happening on these public blockchains to give you even more insight as to you know, which wallets are doing what um, and in what capacity and give you historical data about it and all the insights they can possibly have. Um, I can also see which NFTs a wallet has. Um, and so, you know, if you and I, in conversation, you share with me that you recently bought a certain NFT, um, it's actually very easy for me to de-anonymize your wallet just by looking at the smart contract of the NFT, finding it, and then, you know, seeing which wallet owns that particular NFT. And there you go, I, I found your wallet. So when we talk about privacy, or when I talk about privacy, um, for me, it's clearly a net positive. It's definitely you know, it's definitely a good piece of technology. Uh, privacy protects the consumer because again, people don't realize just how transparent current cryptocurrency systems are. Um, and they don't actually fully understand uh, or what kind of risk they're putting themselves under uh, by having everything so, so out in the open. Um, privacy makes dealing with crypto safer. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of like boast about, you know, I have an NFT collection, it's quite another to, um, you know, have the world to see and some nefarious actors to see uh, exactly the wealth of your wallet based on those NFTs uh, or based on the assets that, that you might possess. Uh, I feel like walking in a, in a conference um, with everyone knowing how much you have in your wallet is, is, uh, is, is a bit strange. Um, and uh, uh, privacy coins or privacy platforms for crypto uh, make cr uh, crypto uh, match the user's expectation of financial privacy a ton more. If you go to a, co a coffee shop with a friend of yours, you don't expect that the barista knows your entire bank history, um, your entire bank statements and, and credit card history. Uh, but in crypto, unfortunately, um, that's kind of what happens. The moment your wallet interacts with somebody else, then they have access to view all the transactions that your wallet has ever had. Um, and so when we talk about privacy, you know, it's kind of a scary word. And I think people have uh, some negative uh, connotations with what that word might mean. Uh, but it actually matches a lot closer to what we expect from our financial privacy, uh, just bridging that over to the, to the crypto world. Um, and the good thing, or at least um, the optimistic way of looking at it, is that there is actually pretty big behavioral change from consumers around privacy. Um, so pre-COVID, you know, we've had uh, tons of research and obviously, you know, tons of um, uh, data leaks that have, paid, that, that have made people more and more concerned about uh, how their data is being used and how their data is actually, you know, being lost from these data breaches. 
And then during COVID, it actually, I think, accelerated quite rapidly people's concern for privacy. So one, uh, one point is that cash is, is disappearing. You know, and during COVID, nobody was accepting cash. Cash is gross. It's icky. Um, so now you have to use uh, digital payments in order to do any purchases. Um, and, you know, as we know, you know, credit, credit card companies actually make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars just selling your credit card data. Um, so that is not necessarily a private way of transacting anymore. Um, and now everything happens online. And so we actually are see, seeing this like pretty massive shift of people using privacy preserving technologies all the way from, from email or, or Signal, which is a private uh, chat system, um, all the way from using DuckDuckGo uh, more frequently, which is kind of like a, like a private search engine. So when we talk about privacy products in crypto, there are actually quite a few. And some of them are what's called layer one projects, meaning that they are their own, you know, their own blockchains. Um, and some of them are tools uh, that are built um, on top or complementary to existing layer one projects. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I just kind of want um, to, to kind of display that. Um, privacy coins um, might have this negative connotation, but we have uh, actually quite a few tools that are making non-private coins like Bitcoin or Ethereum have a bit more private privacy functionality. For Ironfish in particular, um, we're actually pretty excited to build a universal privacy layer for all crypto assets. Um, our goal here is to build uh, the strongest privacy layer one um, that is possible as a foundational product and then uh, allow people to bridge assets from other chains onto Ironfish so that those other assets could have benefit of uh, fully private transactions as well. So effectively, we're uh, building kind of a true layer, a true SSL layer for, for all blockchains. So, um, you know, obviously this, the topic for today uh, is, you know, in some, in some degree is regulation um, and uh, crypto in particular, you know, is always walking on thin ice when it comes to regulation and privacy coins are even at more risk. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, all of a sudden your money laundering concerns are heightened. Um, how am I supposed to track something that I cannot see whatsoever? Um, there's diff definitely a different uh, way that uh, you you might talk to regulated entities uh, have to provide audits. Um, there's now kind of a concern for if I'm a regulated entity dealing with a privacy coin, uh, can I comply with sanctions? Um, and there's like more philosophical reasons, especially for us, the team that are that is building the, this technology of, you know, am I building something for the greater good um, or am I building something that's going to help bad actors? So for Ironfish, um, and this is actually true for other privacy uh, coins or privacy products, um, Ironfish has a, uh, or every Ironfish wallet has a view key. Um, and what a view key is, um, is when you create an, Iron, uh, when you create an Ironfish wallet, um, that wallet actually uh, also has an accompanying view key. Um, and the creator of the wallet can provide this view key to uh, anyone for them to have a read-only access of all of your transactions. So if you are a regulated entity like Coinbase or Kraken or um, whoever else, um, and you need to provide audits for all the activity that has been going on in your platform, um, you could actually provide that uh, using view keys that, and it would be identical to supporting any other non-privacy coin as well. Um, so I kind of wanted to, you know, this wouldn't be, this wouldn't be a crypto presentation without, without a tweet <laughs> snapshot. <laughs> um, and, uh, I kind of want to, uh, uh, voice out this point that, um, you know, like, uh, in 2010, like 2011, Bitcoin was kind of rising popularity. Um, in 2017, we had this huge ICO craze, which brought a lot of people into the system. Um, in 2019, 2020, we had, DeFi, NFTs, um, crypto is becoming more and more mainstream. And I think we're at a point where crypto is no longer going to go away anywhere anytime soon. And so the question is, what is the future of crypto? And also, what is the future of digital money? Um, and uh, a lot of governments, for instance, kind of took the idea of crypto of, OK, this is a technology that's working. Can we incorporate it into, into money? Um, and so CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currencies. Um, and it's the idea that um, instead of kind of fighting crypto, can we embrace it as a technology um, and have digital money uh, that is also a form of cryptocurrency. 
Um, and so kind of as, as builders in this community, we kind of have to ask ourselves, um, you know, we are responsible for this fork that we are on the road, so to speak. Uh, do we proceed with crypto being this extremely transparent form of payment that is uh, quite possibly going to go into this world of surveillance and censorship, ironically? Um, or do we as builders really uh, double down on building a private system um, to not only kind of continue the ethos of all cryptocurrencies, um, but to uh, honestly build <laughs> uh, what I would say is a more optimistic future in terms of, um, in terms of global money? So I'll kind of end it there. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter. My DMs are actually always open. So feel free to, to drop me questions there. Um, the website for Ironfish is ironfish.network. Um, if you have questions about how the technology actually works, or if you want to play around with it, I um, highly encourage you to join our Discord. Uh, we're actually doing our uh, second phase of our incentivized testnet quite soon. Um, so you can play around with Ironfish today if you want to. You can run it on your computer. Um, you can give us feedback as to how hard or how easy that was. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll end it here. Elena, fascinating, really insightful stuff. Um, please tell me you've read The Circle by Dave Eggers. Um, I actually have not. <laughs> Sounds like I should. <laughs> it's exactly what you're talking about, but okay. in you know a little dystopian fictional narrative form. Yeah, these big questions around privacy, they're so important. And that's interesting that you said that most people don't realize that cryptocurrencies are a public ledger and that that might not always be desirable. Um, you started talking about view keys for um, privacy coins. Have like most privacy coins adopted a view key technology? Um, uh, I mean, there are quite a bit that have. Um, I actually know more that have um, than, than those who haven't. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to talk uh, more about them. I saw a question kind of pop in the chat. Mm. What about AML compliance? Um, so again, like view keys kind of give you more, uh, like more leverage to, uh, to, to do uh, anti-money anti laundering compliance. Um, so you can think of it as like as actual money. So like, how does our system work today? Um, like, let's say, you know, the IRS or whoever is suspicious of some activity in the non-crypto world. Like, what is um, what is their go-to strategy? And their go-to strategy is they would go to a bank and they would say, you know, we're kind of suspicious about Stephanie's account. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we're going to subpoena you for the bank statements for this particular, you know, particular account that we are suspicious on. Um, and with view keys, any regulated exchange can actually provide the exact same information. Yeah. Um, you know, the IRS might say like, hey, I think Stephanie, you know, may not, may not be paying her taxes or, or um, you know, is uh, probably getting this money or we might think this should, she might be getting this money from, from sources we don't agree with. Um, could you provide an audit for this particular uh, person's account? Um, and view keys allow regular entities to do that. Um, uh, so um, yeah, it's, 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 it's fairly kind of um, analogous to how we would think of cash as well. Like if you go um, cash out at the ATM and then do something terrible with that cash, um, the bank is not responsible, right? You are responsible as an individual for committing that crime. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so yeah, I think like people don't realize that uh, with view keys, which again, most uh, layer ones actually do have, um, you can get around with all those concerns fairly easily. And the regulatory entity is not seeing the entirety of what's on the wallet or the entirety of the transactions, just that one thing that they need to see. Um, yeah, so so a view key will give access to all the transactions that that particular wallet has made. Oh, okay. Um, so it's not just a little view key. It's like, all right, here's here's all of it. Right. But for instance, let's say you and I interacted, like you might have sent me some money um, and I get a view access for your wallet. Your view key does not show transactions of my wallet, even though you and I interacted. So it does have kind of a one hop view. But yeah. again, it's actually extremely analogous to how um, our monetary system works today. If the, you know, if your bank statement got subpoenaed and you and I interacted, uh, that subpoena doesn't extend to my wallet as well or my bank account as well. Um, so again, fairly analogous to our system today. Fascinating. Our, um, audience is definitely bringing in some questions. We will get to those in the group Q and a Elena. Thank you again. Audience keep bringing those questions, throw them in the comments. Um, we will get to them soon. Our next speaker is the chief security officer at 
Kraken Digital Asset Exchange. Investopedia ranks Kraken as the number four crypto exchange for low fees and experienced traders. Nick Percoco is with us. Welcome, Nick. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about securing your crypto at Kraken. So I'll give you a little you know, roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. So talk a little bit about Kraken's background. You know, go deeper into the security at Kraken and then talk a little bit about what we're doing for education um, within our client base and the, and, and the world beyond that. So a little bit about Kraken from a background perspective, if you're not familiar with who we are, um, we are one of the oldest cryptocurrency exchanges. We, we were founded in 2011, so we're coming up on 11 years old. Um, we do operate in 190 different countries. And today we have um, over 8 million clients. And within that client mix, it's institutions, it's pro traders, um, it's consumers as well. Um, and within the company, we have um, over 3,000 um, Krakenites. Um, those, that's what we call our employees. And our, and our core mission is to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. And, um, and that's what we're all about. My background is that I've been heavily involved in security specifically uh, for about 25 years. Um, actually, my, that's professionally. Um, prior to that, I was, a, I was a, a child of the Chicagoland BBSs and on early internet days um, on IRC as well, um, where I really started to learn about security and um, circumventing controls and all things along those lines. And then, um, then you know, early on in my career, um, worked at lots of early companies in the security realm, places like Internet Security Systems and VeriSign. Um, I founded um, an organization called Spider Labs and ran that for about a decade. And then most recently worked at Rapid7 as well. Um, and then woven in there, um, I also have done a great deal of security research, um, specifically around um, mobile devices, corporate systems, corporate applications, corporate, you know, things that a lot of but organizations use and had, had run um, organizations where we, we constantly would do security research and, um, and, and disclose to those organizations that wrote or provided those products um, vulnerabilities in their software so they can fix it. Um, and then more, more professionally in the last um, several years, I've been in um, chief security officer roles running and building security programs um, for organizations. And, and the most recent is, is Kraken. So I've been with Kraken for about four years. So what we talk about at Kraken it, you know, truly is security above everything. It's not an afterthought. Um, and, and really what that means here is you know, security is our top priority. Um, we, we have, we've built and designed a comprehensive security program to ensure that we're protecting clients' investments. Um, in our, in, in, and, and our teams, and we'll go a little bit more de detail in there, but our teams are made up of some of the top minds in the security industry. Um, you know, many of them I personally recruited after I joined Kraken, but many of them also worked at Kraken when I joined. And, um, and we've been able to implement some very sophisticated measures to prevent theft of funds or attacks on clients' accounts. Um, and then, of course, attacks on our infrastructure as well. And then, of course, it's just not the only piece we're focused on, you know, as a business from like a from a security perspective, like safe, um, being a safe exchange for people to do business with. Um, we also have, you know, a great deal of financial stability, having been around for 11 years. Um, in addition, we have, we keep full reserves um, and we, we, we don't just say we do, um, we cryptographically have verified that um, we're, you know, we're one of the only top exchanges that have actually done a, um, a, a proof of reserves audit um, of the crypto that we hold. Um, and then of course, crypto is like the core of what we do, but we're also um, an on-ramp and an off-ramp for many, many of our clients um, to, to bridge between traditional fiat currency with their bank accounts um, and then also being able to you know, bring that on and off our exchange. And so we have dozens of banking relationships globally. Um, and then, of course, what was you know, mentioned even earlier around uh, you know, compliance and regulatory, um, we have, we have a, a very large um, you know, legal and compliance organization that makes sure that we're keeping keeping ahead of all the various things that we need to do um, as, a, as a global exchange. So as far as like a little glimpse of like what it looks like for us at Kraken, you know, it starts, a, starts first with the comprehensive security program. Many times, and this is, I'm taking sort of myself back to when I was doing security consulting and advisory type work um, prior to being in more of a CISA role, I would meet with organizations and say, you know, hey, can we talk with your security folks? And we'll like a 5,000 person company. And, um, and that just doesn't cut it in cryptocurrency. And so we've built a, a comprehensive security program, everything from our physical controls to our network infrastructure, to the system level security, to like device management, how we manage you know, the computer that I'm actually 
you know, talking to you from today, how we manage identities internally, access control, like all the other, all the pieces that you think you need to pay attention from a security standpoint, we've built into our program. And it's not like one person's responsible for like five things. And we have teams of people that are responsible for those areas and they collaborate, they collaborate together to, to make up our entire security program. Um, the other pieces is, is building security in to, to the products that you, you develop. And, and, and as Kraken, we, 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 we provide products to our clients. You know, we have, we have a, a website that you can log into and, and trade and utilize, um, and, and utilize to, to buy and sell cryptocurrency. But we also have mobile apps and we have interfaces for cons that are more consumer friendly and we have interfaces that are more, uh, more, more pro um, institutional friendly. And all of those products, we constantly are releasing updates. We're constantly making those things better, but we're doing so in a way that's completely in unison um, with our security standards. And so, you know, some things that are mentioned here about security champions, we have security experts that are embedded in all the engineering teams to ensure that uh, when we're thinking about a new product or a new feature, it's not something that we just run straight ahead and then worry about security later. Security is, is top of mind at the beginning. We also hack ourselves constantly. So we, we have a team of people who, who, who constantly are launching, you know, you know, organized crime level, nation state level type campaigns against our organization from the inside, from the outside, in, in, you know, in, in the physical realm and also the, you know, the, the cyber realm as well. And, and then we run a bug bounty program. And so we, we just don't say that we're secure. We want our the research community to help contribute or even prove that, prove that we have, um, you know, we have what we're doing, we're doing what we should be doing. Um, and we receive, you know, a thousand, you know, thousand plus submissions every single year. And a very small percentage of those are actually something that's actionable, something that we are actually able to fix in our systems or, or acknowledge that it's a, it's a legitimate issue. Um, and, and, and you can, you can visit our bug bounty page and you can see stats on that and sort of payouts. Um, but those payouts can range between $500 on the low end up to hundred thousand dollars for the, um, for the most critical findings. If, if someone was to report those to us. Um, also, we, we have proactive security monitoring. You know, we talk about building a security program, all the layers. Um, we monitor everything 24-7, whether it's our internal systems, our, um, our, our, our internal activities that we have going on. Also monitoring, you know, pro proactively monitoring when clients are, are doing things within their accounts as far as, you know, if it's a suspicious login to a client's account um, or, 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 or even just noticing there are phishing sites that pop up or there's fake impersonated Twitter accounts or Instagram accounts. We're constantly monitoring this to ensure that one, um, we can detect things as fast as possible. And two, we can take things down um, if we need to, um, especially from an impersonation standpoint in a, and, a, and a phishing site. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier about the world class team. Um, you know, our, you know the, the team we have, the team that I have supporting me in this, this endeavor um, is, the, is the best and the brightest in the industry. Um, they've, they've worked for some of the you know, world's top brands and they've built, um, they, they've spent decades in, in many cases building security tools and security software um, for, for, some of the, for, for, for some of the best companies out there. One of the other things that we do, and this is what we're very passionate about here at Kraken, is, is securing the entire ecosystem. It's not just about us securing our world, um, not just about us carving out, carving our place out in the world as um, as some place that you know we're the we're the most secure, and we hope everybody else isn't the most secure. That's not the way way we operate. Um, we believe that um, you know ra raising the bar of security within the crypto ecosystem is only going to benefit everybody else on the on the planet. And so, you know, I'm I'm pretty passionate about this. We do a lot of education for our clients. I personally have have. have have recorded several hours of small little segments, like one and a half minute segments of tips for our clients that are available on, you know, available on our website, available on our YouTube channel um, that we send to our clients periodically via email for them to watch um, as far as tips and tricks around how to secure their own world. Um, and then we also launched a couple of years ago, something called Kraken Security Labs. And this is sort of a, a throwback to sort of my earlier time in my career when I ran Spider Labs. It was a Part of that was a very deep technical security research organization, and I brought that to Kraken as well. Um, and within Kraken Security Labs, um, these are these are deep security researchers that go as far as they can on hardware wallets, software wallets, um, even various you know layer one 
layer one networks um, and different technology to try to find security flaws. And when we find those, we just don't blast it out to the world so everybody learns about it. And then you know, the criminals could run and race to try to, you know, try to, try to hack these things. Um, we coordinate with the vendor or the, or the project coordinator and say, hey, we found this problem. You know, here's the details, here's the demo, here's a video of us actually exploiting this, this hardware wallet, for example. Uh, here's what we think you need to do to fix it. And then they go and fix it. They give us an updated firmware. And then we test it. And we're like, yep, that's great. Um, you, you, you now improved it. And so that we jointly go out with like an advisory to the world um, through our blog. And then they may go out on their blog or send a newsletter, send something out to all their clients to like update their firmware. Um, and so, you know, very passionate about that. The internal folks um, within, within Kraken, within my organization, um, we have a group that's called Kraken Security Labs, and that's what they do. They don't, they don't work on other things within the company. They help, they advise, but they're 100% focused on, on the labs type activity. And then the last piece here is to talk about, you know, education. Um, you know, you know that, that piece as well. Um, you know, again, I mentioned all the videos and things that I've done or, you know, we've done internally. Um, but we often talk internally about being proactively, proactively and productively paranoid. You know, what we mean by that is, you know, you can, you can put all these constraints around your world, around security, and be extremely paranoid about everything that, that you, have to, you have to do or maybe everything that you're about to do. And, um, but that's not very helpful. You, know, you really can't transact with the world. You can't do the things that we want people to do with crypto. And so what we, want, what we train our own internal employees and what we talk to our clients about is, is being productively paranoid. What that means is don't blindly just go and do things. Um, think about what you're doing. Um, have your security hygiene at the highest levels you possibly can, but at a point where you actually can live and, the, and you can transact in, in, in the world we're trying to build. And so some of the things that you know, we talk about as far as tips for our clients and for the greater world, you know, first one here seems like it's basic, you know, you know, choosing strong, unique, pa unique passwords. Um, but we know, uh, we know from, from the investigations that we've done, um, especially with clients and, and other folks in the industry, that's something that people still don't really do. It's, it's not a very difficult thing to do, but they don't. Um, and when we talk about unique passwords, it's not just unique passwords when you're using Kraken, it's unique passwords on everything. Um, because what typically happens is if there's a compromise at some blog that you, you know, or newsletter site that you, that you, that you, that you signed up for, and your password was compromised there, and it's the same password you use in 50 other places, well, th there you go. The attackers now can try that same username and password combo in other places and get access to one of your accounts. Um, the other piece is 2FA. I, you know, it, it sort of amazes me how many people we hear about they get compromised and they just don't utilize 2FA. Um, and in fact, you know, there's different layers of sort of effectiveness of 2FA. Um, we recommend using a, a security key. Um, or, or something like F uh, FIDO2 compatible security key, uh, because that's something that is, you know, it's in your hand. You can unplug it from your system. You can store it in a safe, and then you can plug it in when you need it to. Um, it can't be fished, and um, it's not something that can be, you know, that can be easily, you know, easily lost or, or destroyed if it's a physical piece that you can store someplace rather than your phone breaks and it falls, you know, falls down a well. Um, you may lose your, your 2FA method um, because of that. Um, the other piece is to only keep what you need for your normal activity on exchanges. You know, if you're, if you're someone who's trading constantly, obviously you need to keep a lot of crypto uh, on, an, uh, on an exchange. But if you're someone, who, if you're someone who's staking you know, through like somebody like Kraken, obviously you need to keep the crypto there to stake. Um, but that being said, if you're someone who's you know, you know, investing in crypto, investing, you, know, you're, you have a diversified portfolio, you're investing every single week, every single month, whenever you get a paycheck, you buy 10% you know, or 20% of your, your paycheck goes to crypto. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you know, you're, you're storing those things in, in places like a hardware wallet. Get yourself a hardware wallet, initialize it correctly, follow all the directions, you know, have your seed word backup stored in a safe place, and then send your crypto there on a periodic basis to make sure that the balance is, is correct, where you have the majority of your, of your crypto kept in your own cold storage and the rest that you need to deal with and, and, and trade with or use to spend with um, are, are kept in a place that's more accessible to you. Um, and then one, you know, one of the last ones here, you hear a lot about people getting compromised in the media, and you hear a lot about things like NFT theft and other activity going on. Um, for the most part, these are not highly technical attacks. They're not, you know, not someone who's, you know, a super hacker that's figuring out a way to circumvent some controls in a hardware wallet, or they're figuring out a way to find a flaw in a blockchain. 
Um, they're not doing that. They are, they're social engineering individuals. There's been a large number of NFT compromises where it was as simple as someone on the Discord channel, you know, DMing the person who owned a whole bunch of valuable NFTs and then convince them somehow in a social engineering way, convince them to copy and paste their MetaMask seed words to the person on Discord. And five minutes later, sure enough, all of their NFTs are gone and all of the Ethereum and all, you know, everything that's stored in that MetaMask wallet is gone. And so, you know, be very, very, you know, wary about what you brag about, what you show off, um, because what we, you know, was just spoke about uh, you know, by Elena in the previous presentation, uh, people can trace these things back to you and then they can start targeting you and try to, and try to get access um, to your crypto. And so the you know, last one here is be productively paranoid. This isn't meant to scare you. It's not meant for you to lock down and, and hide in a closet someplace. Um, it's meant for you to you know, understand your boundaries and then also think before, um, before you do things um, in, in sort of the, in the world we live in. So that's all I have. Um, Stephanie, I can turn it back over to you. Great. Yeah, Nick, I love the perspective that Kraken takes that it's not a zero sum game that you want security to be a part of the entire crypto ecosystem. Um, your bug bounty program also caught my attention. And if there's any, you know, coder hacker types out there that uh, that want to get that hundred thousand dollar bounty, what should they be looking for? What are those most critical findings? Yeah, or, you know. Yeah, so we, we defined it on. We, there's a certain criteria of flaws. Um, it would be something like you know, like an authentication bypass or a remote code execution, you know, something along those lines um, would, would qualify in, in, in that sort of category. Um, and, that's, and that's sort of like, you know, the holy grail of things for, for people who are, who are bug money participants. There's an active community about, around that. We, we know all the people who, who actively participate in our bug bounty program. We have a wall of, a wall of fame um, and, we, and we list some of those folks. Um, and um, no, it's, it's just, a, it's a real, I mean, we do all these other things prior to that bug bounty program even sort of being exposed to the, to the outside world. And so th this, is, this is the last mile of sort of like validation that, um, that everything we've been doing is, 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 is efficient um, or is sufficient. And what we actually do is when there is a bug, if there is something like there's a minor you know, issue that someone found, um, we, we actually triage that. Um, obviously, we triage that and get it fixed. But then we triage, you know, how did this actually end up here? Um, you know, what do we need to do? What are the things we need to change in our world um, and our processes to make sure that something like that doesn't, doesn't surface again? And, that, and that's the whole reason why we have that bug bounty program. It's, the, it's sort of the last mile. Of, yeah. of, of, of knowledge of, of, of all of all the security testing and everything we're doing in order to um, to make sure that we're, we're buttoned up. Nice. Yeah. Great way to take advantage of those brilliant minds that love to try and hack. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also, Nick, just want to say thank you for that short list at the end of practical tips. I think those are all really great takeaways from your presentation. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Um, we will bring Nick back shortly for our group conversation. We just have one more guest to speak. And this is our, a guest from our sponsor, Oryx. So big thank you um, for sponsoring today's event. Um, we are going to hear from Oryx's CEO and co-founder. Oryx, of course, is an all-in-one cryptocurrency terminal that integrates data, content, and strategies to help crypto traders make better decisions. Um, Georgi Kaz... I can do this. Kazaradzi, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Uh, close. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to see your, seeing your presentation. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Georgi. Uh, I'm the CEO of Orox. Um, in the past few years, we've seen cryptocurrency blow up, but it's actually on a trajectory to grow as fast as the internet did in the early 90s and in, into the early 2000s as well. But it, this significant growth in crypto has posed a lot of challenges. There are growing pains. Um, there's issues with security. There's issues with usability. Um, people are getting hacked. People are losing money because they don't understand the environment. These same issues existed back during the internet days. Um, even up until 2010, there were so many people get losing money. And even today, they're losing money. But the internet has gotten better. And crypto needs to get better. These opportunities, these challenges present opportunities for people such as myself, the founders, to make cryptocurrency easy and accessible to everyone, but at the same time secure. But before we get more into that, I want to go back to 2017 and where Orox uh, started off from. Orox was founded in 2017 with me and two other founders. We were investing in crypto. We were investing in companies that we thought were going to take off, that were going to grow significantly. 
And from there, we realized that we can invest in ourselves. We can create a platform that we were proud of because there was just not a lot back then. Um, data was fragmented. Uh, we've had so many different exchanges all at once, different tokens being listed everywhere. So we wanted to create an all-in-one trading terminal that we as traders would use and we would be proud of. So we created Aurox. Aurox over the next few years was developed to allow customizable workspaces, powerful proprietary indicators, real-time data, and it was all self-funded by us. Uh, when we released the terminal in 2020, from there we saw a tremendous organic growth. And today, 70,000 users utilize the terminal. These users are able to utilize our terminal for free and take advantage of the tools that we've created for them and for us as well. But now we need to look to the future. We need to look to the future of not just crypto, but finance itself. And the future of finance is decentralized finance. It is Web3. That is the real core utility of crypto. For the past several years, people have been taking advantage of a very speculative market. But now, in the past year, it has changed. There's been real utility that's been created. And it is no wonder people are investing so much in DeFi. In quarter four of 2020, more than $2.4 billion was invested in decentralized finance. That is the largest amount of investment that quarter in the emerging technology sector. And DeFi has been the largest emerging technology in two, two quarters running. And the reason people are investing so much is because it eliminates the middleman. It allows developers to create unique financial products that live directly on the blockchain. There's no banks involved. There's no people involved. You develop a product, you push it on the blockchain, and it lives there and does some very unique things with finance. But before we go into how the system, the current system is being uh, solved, let's look at the current financial system as it is today. Big banks can act as gatekeepers into the financial industry. If you don't have connections, you can't raise money. If you don't have contacts, you'll always be stuck in the same situation as you were born in. They control millions and billions of dollars worldwide. They get rich off of your money and my money by leveraging it and making sometimes very aggressive decisions. And those aggressive decisions lead them to going bankrupt and then getting bailed out. This is a drain on society. And they don't even tell people exactly what they're doing. It's not transparent. They use your information against you. They sell you products high interest rates in order to make more money off of the basically the retail, the, the entire nation. They declare record profits and these record profits flow into the CEOs. They get tens of millions of dollars in bonuses every year while people go bankrupt from high interest rates, high lending rates, and everything that is currently uh, toxic in the current financial system. And DeFi and Web3 is the solution to that. This is why people have been screaming about and why DeFi took, on, took off on such a huge trajectory. It's person-to-person -person finance. It allows users to send and receive money, but on top of that, now we have smart contracts that allow you to borrow, lend, and do automation directly on the blockchain. You can take part in yield and liquidity mining without a middleman. It's just a code that is open source, living, and breathing for the sole purpose to eliminate that middleman, eliminate that single centralized authority and be completely transparent. These smart contracts are automated immutable code that run on the blockchain. The automated immutable code means that there is no way to change the code. It lives on the blockchain. It does one simple function. But all of this is a technical aspect of Web3 and DeFi. It is very difficult for the average user to take advantage of it. Um, you need hardware wallets or software wallets that live on your computer. You need to understand what contracts you're interacting with. And there's a lot of security issues that go on right now with decentralized finance. The Web3 wallets I just mentioned, there's several of them. Uh, they act as a doorway to the blockchain. They allow you to communicate directly with the Ethereum network, Binance network, or whatever blockchain that you you're trying to take advantage of. Some of the key players in this game are MetaMask, TrustWallet, and Coinbase, and they've been spending a significant amount of money and growing extremely quickly because, as I mentioned, it is the future of finance and the wallets are your doorway to that uh, aspect of it. 
But these current solutions at times have very bad user experience. They're geared towards their early adopters. They're geared towards people like me. They're not geared towards the general audience. And because of that, you can't go from early adopter to mass adoption without making it easy. And they're prone to hacks. Uh, just as it was mentioned multiple times uh, during this uh, um, live event, people have been losing money from Web3 hacks, from uh, wallet hacks. And we can see day after day, people are losing hundreds of millions of dollars. They're losing money simply by trying to better their financial ecosystem. And imagine you're not losing money when you get hacked because you made a bad investment. You're losing money because of an attacker. This is extremely bad for the growth of DeFi and growth of Web3 in general. So we need to fix that situation, but not just that, but the user experience as well. As we can see from variety of comments on Twitter, uh, reviews, Telegram, wherever you go, people are having issues with bridges and uh, the wallets, the 12 key pass rates. It's just difficult to use. How, how are you gonna get to that mass adoption when even the tech enthusiast crowd that are the early adopters are having these problems. If we don't fix this user experience problem, then there is no mass adoption in crypto. And that's very sad. So we need to do better. How do we do that? We protect the user from themselves. So that's a security aspect. If we pass the security to the user themselves, people are gonna make mistakes. They, depending on how safe your server is, if the user themselves is not educated enough or you don't implement certain functionalities, they're eventually gonna lose their money because they're gonna get fished and very simple hacking methods, I think Nick mentioned it as well. We need to protect them from themselves. In order to do that, we can implement multi-factor authentication systems. We can prevent them from being able to type in their 12 key passphrase into a website. We can protect them from interacting with smart contracts that are not open source or that have been banned before. For example, with what we're doing at Orox, with our Orox wallet is coming out in the next few months or next few weeks actually, we're gonna be whitelisting specific contract addresses. So if a user goes to a website that they think is Uniswap, but in reality it's not, they'll be able to see that directly in their wallet. Now it will have an override. Maybe a user wants to get hacked for whatever reason, but it will have an override. But for the general audience, it will have a check mark. We'll make sure that they're protected and safe so they don't have to worry about it. In addition to that, we're gonna be mimicking the Web2 experience. 12 key passphrases are very difficult for people to understand. Uh, importing private keys. Yes, this is something that we're used to, but this is not something that everyone else's. So we're gonna mimic the user experience, the environment that they're used to, something that everyone knows, something that they're used to on Facebook or Twitter, logging in with their username and password, but protecting them and making Web3 accessible through our wallet and growing DeFi for the better. So just to wrap everything up, uh, Web3 right now is growing at an insane speed, but there's a lot of problems with that. And if we don't solve them, it will stagnate. We need to solve the security. We need to solve the usability and the usefulness of Web3. This is where Orox comes in. We're tackling these problems this year. We're creating our own wallet. We're creating our mobile application that is all powered by decentralized finance, but the front end mimics the environment that they're used to and doing everything necessary to offset the security aspect from the user to us. We want the, we'll obviously be educating them. We have education programs within our terminal right now, but at the same time, there's only so much you can do. You can't force the user to sit there and read in order to make one single trade. Imagine trying to tell a user that, oh yeah, by the way, you have to download the application, read this entire guide, and then be able to trade. You're not gonna have growth. They need to jump right in and be able to do whatever they want, be able to invest immediately without worrying about the security aspects. That's gonna be done for them. And Web3 delivers this incredible transparency and financial independence and automation that is unique in this entire world. So we can leverage that with our unique front end. And 
we will push this field to new levels. The current solutions, they're still trying to get, uh, they're still trying to accommodate the tech enthusiast crowd, but eventually that tech enthusiast crowd is gonna run out. We're gonna change that and make it to not just the tech enthusiast crowd, but for the massive audience out there that wants the financial independence. My information is at the bottom. Uh, thank you if you guys have any questions. Uh, we'll actually, we'll probably be doing a QA, but if you wanna reach out to me on the email, um, I'm always available. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we actually had a question in the chat that was very relevant to one of the things you were talking about. Um, and it was about protecting yourself from harmful smart contracts. And you were highlighting that this is a feature of your upcoming uh, wallet. First of all, you said just a few weeks away. When is that wallet going to come out? So uh, next month, uh, this upcoming month, we'll do a very private alpha release, which will be just you know a handful of uh, our users. Um, we want to take it a step at a time because some of the things that we are integrating are unique. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so... Alpha will be this upcoming month, then the beta the following month, and then we'll see depending on you know bug fixes and issues when the production yeah. version is released. Oh, that's exciting. And so the solution that you offered to protect users from harmful smart contracts is just so I understand you just kind of flag them, whereas in other wallets, they would maybe be a little more cryptic. Yeah, um, so we're actually gonna be relying on the blockchain itself to do this as well. Um, we're gonna be whitelisting as, and we're probably going to create a library as well to make it public so other people can utilize it. Uh, we're going to create a library where it's all the whitelisted addresses of the top companies out there and slowly extend that list. If a contract is not on our list and it is also not open source, then we're going to flag it for the user and say, you know, you should probably not be interacting. Because if it's an attacker, if it's a fraudulent smart contract, chances are they're not going to make that code open source to anyone. Interesting. Um, that way... Yeah when they at least see some kind of warning message when they're interacting with those fraudulent contracts. Yeah, that's a great solution. Awesome. Okay, we have a lot of questions to get to and only about 40 minutes to do it. So let me go ahead and invite all of our speakers to turn on their cameras, come to the stage. I want to start with a conversation about regulatory risk, one of the um, many risks we've talked about today. Obviously, the future of crypto is going to depend a lot on how it's regulated. Um, back in 2016, when the SEC actually did have some action against Ripple with their coin offering, Ripple was like, oh, we're a coin used for making international payments. We're not an investment. We shouldn't be overseen by the SEC. So I want to ask each of you if you could advise the SEC on how to regulate let's say Bitcoin specifically, um, what would you say? How would you argue what kind of an asset Bitcoin is as well and how it should be regulated? Um, let me throw it to Nick to start. Yeah, I mean, this is, that's a good question. I don't play in the regulatory space really at all. We have, we have lots of lawyers and I'm not one of them. Nice. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I, you know, I, I do believe that, um, that this will, you know, this will, this will start to sort of become less gray over time. And I think, we probably have some other folks on, on, on the panel that probably have some great ideas for the SEC in order to, to advise them on things. But I, I think I think over time, I think this will become less gray as, as things we, gets clear. And I think it'll become more more inclusive um, and more acceptable um, rather than being, you know, being the, being this notion of like, oh, well, this is a, this is high risk or this is this is this is not legitimate um, because it's not regulated or because it's not um, not something that's recognized. But I think over time, I think we're going to see it become more recognized. Yeah, maybe I actually should have started with Jody because your presentation went through these like definitions of the assets and how Bitcoin can kind of span across those definitions. Um, Jody, how would you define Bitcoin specifically and how do you think the SEC should regulate it? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I don't know that the SEC is the right organization to regulate it. Um, you know, if you think about commodities being regulated by the CFTC mainly, uh, is Bitcoin a security? You know, that. What do you think? <laughs> um, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think I don't think so. You know, there's there's definitions of the Howey test and things that people can test. And I'm not a regulatory expert, but just based on my my own observations, it doesn't really look like a security to me um, as much as it might look like a commodity or a currency. Uh, so, 
you know, and across the digital assets, there's now so many kinds that I wouldn't even be comfortable saying that one regulatory body should be the regulator for every single one. Right. Um, or different part of it. Like you've got the tran- the code, the transaction, you've got this cryptography component, you've got the blockchain, the ledgers, the companies that are running it. Like there's all these different parts of this ecosystem and do all of them get regulated the same way? Um, I think that we'll see some of the regulatory framework break up um, a little bit like how you might see different regulators regulating healthcare companies versus energy companies, or, you know, these are different kinds of things. So uh, yeah, I don't know that the SEC is the right, the right body to be regulating Bitcoin, um, even though they do regulate things like ETFs. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, interesting to parse it out and get very specific about the stage of the transaction, the different, um, all the different types of cryptocurrencies out there and assigning them their own precise regulatory body. I hope that, as Nick said, that education gets to the point where our legislators are able to parse that out and do that. Um, Georgi, what do you think? Um, I agree with Jody. Um, I think... uh when you start involving politicians and things that they don't understand, um, it starts getting very messy. Um, as we saw when, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was on trial or whatever you want to call that. Um, and they were asking him questions about Facebook. Um, they couldn't even understand Facebook in some of those questions and let alone cryptocurrency. Um, I think there needs to be another regulatory body set up that is, probably at least 50% uh, developers and then 50% attorneys or lawyers or whatever you want to call them. Um, Because, I mean, explaining the blockchain to anyone that is not involved in blockchain is extremely difficult, let alone trying to set regulations around it. Um, And there's really great attorneys now in crypto uh, that would probably love to write a good regulatory uh, rule book around it. and yeah, I think SEC just needs to set up a different body, as Jody mentioned, and um, it needs to be handled properly with input from actual developers and, and people that are very involved in this business. Yeah, that's a great idea. Why move forward with regulation when you really don't understand it? Um, great solution. Karan, you want to talk about hackers? Yeah, first of all, thank you for the amazing presentation that everyone has given. It was a very insightful discussion. Uh, I would like to just ask a question about the recent exploits that we have seen in over the past few months and past four, few years, actually. Uh, last month, we actually saw Ax- Axie Infinity lose more than $600 million in USDC and, and Ether. And even yesterday, we saw uh, Board Ape's uh, Instagram account being hacked and somebody impersonating them and uh, actually withdrawing money and taking away NFTs from them. So what were your experiences with with such exploits and what do you think are the learnings from this and what are the things that people can do differently in such cases? Let's start with Georgi and Nick probably can jo- jump in. Yeah, um, I mean, the first thing I think that is leading to a lot of these attacks uh, towards the smart contract side is uh, companies, are, I think, are feeling, especially in DeFi, are feeling that they need to develop very, very quickly um, and get products out quickly uh, without properly testing them and properly uh, getting multiple audits done. And even in that case, it, it's fairly difficult. But I think it's moving so quickly, this entire space is that if you're not pushing something out on a constant basis, you're getting left behind. And that's leading to some of these attacks on you know smart contracts or blockchains. Um, I think there's needs to be a little more concern about the fact that you're pushing out code that could potentially have billions of dollars in it. Um, and in, in reality, some of these companies just care about where their token price is going to go up um, and trying to push out code as fast as possible. Now, as far as the, um, uh, the users themselves, this is, again, it's kind of going back to what I spoke about. It's really up to the developers, at least in DeFi, to protect the users as much as possible. And I feel like they're not doing it enough. Um, centralized exchanges like Nick, Kraken, they do a great job. 
but I think DeFi is is, is lacking on some of the security aspects right now. Um, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't tell the user, oh yeah, you just lost money, you know, that's, that's on you, that, that your NFT was stolen because you typed in your 12 key passphrase, we don't care about you. Um, that's the user that's probably never gonna come back to crypto and that impacts the entire cryptocurrency market in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, yeah, I definitely agree. I think, you know, security as a field or even, even cryptography as a field has been around for decades. We know how to secure information. We know how to secure assets. We know how to do these types of things. Um, the problem that we, we were in, and I think you mentioned this in your presentation, is I really believe it's more of a UX problem than it is a security problem um, for the most part. Yeah, uh, and, and, and Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, users are asked to do some very technical things at the stage that the crypto industry, that the stage that the smart contract world, DeFi world exists. Um, people who want to be early adopters who are not technical enough to understand what they're doing, um, it's, it, it is a UX problem, right? They, they, will, they will easily, you know, sign something that they don't know what they're signing, and now they just, you know, transferred all of their assets to somebody else, um, and they have no idea that they're doing that. They think that they're signing a, you know, you know going to do some, participate in DeFi and get some sort of yield from that, and then all of a sudden they look and their wallet's empty. Right. So there's there is this aspect of like we're at this stage where the usage is it, it, it is sort of usage and the, and the exposure that it's getting to to people who are not um, able to read smart contracts um, specifically um, is getting to a place where you know, that's more popular than the industry itself on how to, you know, you know abstract that, that security to those users um, is, is getting to a place where it's, we're, we're too far ahead, right? Like the users are growing, like a, a DeFi platform can go viral and no one's even checked, that, checked out the security of it, let alone even know who, who's running the DeFi platform. Um, we've actually found some DeFi um, you know, applications out there in the past in our research where there, there was some, some pretty critical vulnerabilities. We could not find the people that were behind the DeFi platform. Um, like literally there were some pseudonym names on Twitter and they would not respond to our, 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 our messages at all. I mean, like, what do you do? Like, even as a security person. So, I mean, you can imagine sort of the, the, the issues that people run into as consumers of this. I think, you know, the, the place of like whitelisting smart contracts, you know, in, you know, in, in various places, um, whether it's the tools um, or within a centralized exchange that's going to, you know, participate in some DeFi so that the, so that the consumer has the ability to, to have somebody else they can trust um, when they don't have the ability to trust themselves, I, I think is, a, is an area we have to go to. Because not everybody is going to be able to, to navigate this at the very technical level that people need to navigate today in order to be, to be safe. Jody, what do you think about ways to prevent hacks in the future? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, uh, look, at, at Coindesk, uh, in, in indices in that industry classification standard that I, I showed you, we actually have a whole research team that goes through every single digital asset to learn about the use case. And, and we've found a number of assets that look like fraud or something. You know, you can't, the website, nobody responds. You know, it, it's, it, it's amazing because the market cap itself got up big enough to get to the top 500 of whatever a universe of over 10,000. And you think, all right, well, if got this big, then it's probably meaningful in some way. And, and you start to do research and you realize, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about this. And we'll, we'll toss it out. But, you know, I'm almost considering making a category of like potential fraud coins or something <laughs> because... It's uh, it, it happens, and to manage the risk, like I said, I don't know yet that we can identify ahead of time um, with certainties for the for the for the coins and the assets that do make it through and actually get assigned industries. Maybe, maybe which ones will act, um, and I think that that's similar to a lot of the companies that we invest in in general. You know, we don't always identify a blow up or in a hedge fund. You don't always identify like whatever made off or buy you or ahead of time. You don't know what sometimes um, hackers or when, when people want to do bad things, they'll do bad things. Um, so from an investment's perspective, 
I think diversify, like go for the whole basket. And if you have a loser, then maybe it's not that big of a deal because you didn't take that big of a position. So I, I think that that's how I would try to manage that risk without really having the crystal ball um, or, or having it obvious or blatant in front of me looks, you know, um, like it's an unreliable asset. You can make an educated guess. You can. <laughs> will, you can. will their customer service get back to you? <laughs> Isn't that a good, um, good indicator? <laughs> Yeah, there you go. That's one indicator, one of many. Um, you know, speaking of nefarious actors, it's really sad to see how cyber attacks are being used as like a tool of destruction during wartime all over the world. Are, are crypto platforms um, beefing up security in terms of like these international crypto attacks that we're seeing? Um, Nick, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I mean, um, as far as maybe can you clarify that question? Well... I mean, Russia is really doing a lot of cyber attacks on Ukraine to try and break down their economy and their government and their infrastructure. And I just wonder how much, um, obviously that's horrific over there, but I wonder how much um, crypto platforms based in America are considering, uh, you know, safeguarding themselves for the future as international yeah, I mean, relations get more tense. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, as far as, you know, attacks from, from, from other folks, right. You know, from, from Russia and other, other places, just because, because the war started, wasn't the first time we had that concern. So that's, that's right. definitely, um, that's always been a concern. I've been doing this for a long time. So, so there's that piece. Um, but the other piece, I guess, from an international relations, um, you know, we, we do have clients that are, that are in Ukraine. And so, you know, we actually, we actually did a campaign, um, where we are, we are, we made donations, um, and funded all of our Ukrainian clients accounts. Um, you know, I think the, the really? entire campaign is going to be up to about $10 million worth of, worth of Bitcoin that'll get deposited in their accounts over the, over several tranches and over a period of time. So, so yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to, trying to do what we can, um, in that respect. And then as far as, you know, international, you know, international, you know, activities, um, there's, you know, there's still a lot of places in the world where crypto is, 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 is not regulated at all, or, you know, you know, trade, you know, firms or anything, you know, from that, from that perspective, um, but as those things come online, um, you know, we do have a large, you know, compliance and legal, you know, capability within the company um, that is able to then have discussions um, with those entities um, or with those countries. And so we, we are constantly having um, conversations with dozens and dozens of countries, I would imagine, um, all the time on, on, on sort of how do we operate and how do we provide services to their citizens, um, you know, it, it, to, you know, meeting all of their, meeting all of the requirements, um, you, even in the, even in the, existence of not, you know, of, of no laws existing there. Jody, do you have any insights into crypto trading platforms beefing up security in um, response to like tense international relations or cyber attacks? Um, I mean, I think that there's just this constant drive of beefing up security in the relentless effort to improve as it evolves because it's just so emerging uh you know whether there's a, a specific war or tension or attack or not but uh i do think that the russia ukraine conflict is bringing some light to some of the benefits of crypto um if anything like even just like multiple copies of the ledger like uh, you know physically like a bomb would have to take out every single computer that ever stored Yep. Bitcoin or something in, in order to destroy that. Um, and their outage of one of the coins, I, I don't remember what it was. It's some small localized coin. I experienced uh, an outage um, in the Ukraine. But, you know, I think that, uh, again, this idea of decentralized information that is encoded and decoded and stored according to the blockchain has been shown to be beneficial in this case than, um, than prone to hacking. Yeah. Georgi, what do you think? Um, I think it's it just goes past the war as well because uh, the apparently their own attack uh, was orchestrated by North Korea. At least that's what yeah. I read the articles on. So I think it's been an ongoing case for, for a very long time. I think there was another attack that was worth tens of millions of dollars that was also uh, apparently North Korea uh, attackers. So 
I really think it, it's been a, on the constant uh, mind of everyone and what we're doing with our software right now, it's also on a constant mind. As soon as you hold any type of cryptocurrency, however small, you just become a target um, from anyone and everyone. And unfortunately, the state actors are much smarter and much more funded than anyone else. And it's, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, at the end of the day, every website ever has gotten hacked. Um, it's just figuring out how to minimize those losses. Facebook has gotten hacked, Amazon, everything. Um, it's not if, it's when. Um, and I think that is, I mean, that's how we're approaching it. I think that's how a lot of big companies in crypto are also approaching it is if we're going to get hacked, what's the repercussions? Is How do we save as much money as possible? Yeah, that's a wise perspective. Karan, you got our next question? Yeah. So just diving deep into the security aspect of crypto, many of the users are, you know, I mean, they have heard about your tips and especially Nick talking about having cold wallets and hardware wallets, you know. So that is great, but there are concerns about what if you lose the the credentials to that wallet. So what do you do after that? So any thoughts on? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can I can speak to that. So we, um, so one, and that's why when we, when we speak to our clients, we talk about following the instructions for the initialization of that wallet um, to the T. Like, don't be the person that like opens it up and throws away the instructions, right? Like, and doesn't follow along like, like we did when we, when we were kids, when we had to build something. Um, you follow what it says. Um, and in most of the wallet providers, there is a very specific step about writing down your, your seed words in a way in, in, on, you know, an archival with archival ink or whatever with on paper. Um, and then putting that in a safe place that is kept separate from your hardware wallet. Um, you can make multiple copies of that and put them in safe places. Um, now, of course it has to be a safe place because someone gets the seed words, they can clone your hardware wallet as well. So there is that balance. Um, but um, but that's that's the best way so that when you have your hardware wallet, if you're, you know, happen to drop it and it breaks or something, um, you could just order another one from the manufacturer and then restore your your wallet. Um, that's that's the big piece. And then um, if you happen to lose the seed words and you have to happen to then um, go and, um, and and break your wallet, well, then, you know, you're, you could be in some trouble. Um, but even if you forget the, the password to get into it, there are some companies out there. Um, just be, be, be careful. There are some companies out there that do offer, um, you know, wallet recovery services and they'll take like a cut if they're, if they're successful. Um, but you, you really need to do your homework there because very easily someone could say, Hey, I wasn't successful. And, um, and then your wallet's emptied. So you, you need to make sure that's a reputable firm before you, how, before you start going. How does that. that even work? Wallet recovery. It's not like a little, you know, pick lock that you can do. <laughs> It's not. And so this is this sort of is similar to some of the research we've done. Um, their hardware wallets um, in general, um, they are much more secure, right, than keeping you know, your crypto on like a software wallet on your computer, right? Because the hardware wallet, the nation, notion of that, it's offline all the time. You can keep it in a safe. You can keep it someplace. Now, they are still computers, right? They still run some firmware on it. Um, you, you still start them up and they still do things. Um, there have been... Um, hardware wallets in the past, and I think most of the popular ones have had some flaws that have allowed um, someone to extract, if you have physical possession of it, that you can extract the seed, you can extract the seeds from it. Um, mm. Now, those flaws continuously get fixed. But if someone like hasn't updated their firmware in like two years, and then they forgot their pin, there may be a likelihood that there could be a vulnerability that would allow someone to then recover those seed words for them um, should they forget the pin for that hardware wallet. So that's a cold wallet, but what about hot wallets? Is that possible for some third party to recover if you've forgotten your um, seed trace? Yeah, um, possibly because like a, like a software wallet, you know, something you may have in your computer is typically secured with a password and um, they, they, can, they can possibly take that you know, wallet file from you um, and run it through some sort of crap, you know, some sort of password cracking capability. Um, and if oh. they happen to, if you, if you happen to choose a weak password, um, it's not so great from a security perspective, but you might be in luck from a recovery perspective. So huh. if you, you know, if, the, if you, if your password to get into your software wallet on your computer was one, two, three, four, five, someone, and you, but you forgot it was that, um, someone could probably recover it. Um, but if it's, you know, hundred character alphanumeric random upper and lowercase and symbols, probably won't be able to
will be recovered. And so it sort of like depends, I guess, um, but, th- but th- those things can be possible as well. Mm. Georgi, do you have insight into um, recovering wallets? Yeah, actually, uh, my partner uh, lost a significant amount of money because he was trying to recover his wallets. And apparently there's like a bug in like a very small fraction of, uh, uh, I can't remember what uh, wallet he was using, and it recovers a completely different wallet. Um, and he doesn't know the password to the JSON file. And he lost a significant amount of money uh, that's stuck in there. And he's been safe. He wrote down an entire notepad of like different passwords uh, that he thinks it might be. And he's waiting until he gets the right time to try to brute force it. But we'll see. These are the juiciest <laughs> stories. I wish we could have an event where people just come on and tell these stories. <laughs> yeah, it was his uh, savings account, basically. And it's just gone uh, permanently. Well, Hopefully not permanently, but Hopefully not. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, that's another thing that we're trying to tackle is the recovery of uh, definitely not hardware wallets, but the software wallets. So the, our wallet system, uh, we have a few ideas on it uh, that we're going to be implementing. But right now, it's uh, that, that's the part of the user experience issue is you lose that 12 key passphrase and that's it. That's game over. Um, I think one is making sure the user is educated and to implementing a different solution, which we're going to. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, there just needs to be a different solution. People need to think outside the box. Like we have some ideas. There's probably companies out there that have probably better ideas and no one's really looking at this problem head on. Uh, they're thinking, oh yeah, people just write down a 12 key passphrase. Like that's normal. They'll recover it with that technically not that normal yeah what about when that doesn't happen yeah exactly they're in a lot of trouble (laughs) yeah so um i think there needs to be a real discussion about how that recovery process works because you can't rely on every single person writing that down and remembering it and it it just doesn't scale it doesn't scale to the massive audience yeah jody do you have any um juicy stories about wallets being lost or found (laughs) No, I've heard one or two, but I uh, luckily have not personally experienced anything of the sort. Any insights into um, the like technical solutions that might be um, able to be brought about to recover wallet phrases? No, that's not something that I work on. So <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't have any solutions. Just don't, don't lose your keys. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I wonder if anyone is interested in talking about um, comparing the security of proof of work protocol versus proof of stake. Nick, um, do you have any advice for listeners on that? Yeah, no, not particularly. Um, yeah. I mean, it's probably not the, you know, we, I have, a, I have a whole team of cryptographers, and again, my, my area is, that's not my area of expertise, but, um, but yeah, um, I don't know if, if anybody else has some comments on that. Yeah, um, I mean, I understand both. It's just, it's not really uh, uh, part of my area either. Our coder, Elena, is no longer here. That would have been a great yeah. question for yeah. her. It would have been a great question for her. Yeah. <laughs> she could just like explain everything to everyone. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, Crypto platforms that have remote employees. Um, actually, all three of your platforms probably have remote employees. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We are a fully remote company. Oh yeah, wow. We have, we have, we, yeah, we're most ninety nine percent of our employees do not have, do not go into an office. That's yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. What about CoinDesk? Yeah, we can work um, from the offices that we have or remotely, I think that it's really up to what's best for the individual and the team. So yeah, we can work from anywhere. So are there extra precautions that your companies are taking um, as far as security measures for remote employees? Um, Georgi, what about you? Yeah, um, we've always managed our company uh, remotely, um, even our other companies that we had previously. Um, As far as security, um, just kind of the basics, Usually for us, we try to keep our developers a little hidden uh, because it's a, it opens up an attack vector. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, people, especially in DeFi, when you have a token or website, they want the whole team on there. And I think that's a mm-hmm. very bad idea because um, each every, every single one of those individuals becomes an attack vector. 
um, and you know, keeping making sure that they're using their corporate email for work and uh, setting up the two FAs and, and everything uh, in between. Uh, we actually need to do a little better on that end, but because we've kept most of our employees hidden for the most part, it's a lot easier for us to prevent even the first step of the attack. Yeah, that's a great preventative measure. And I think that 2FAs are kind of a simple solution to such a big problem. Um, Jody, does Coindesk have um, special security protocols for remote workers? Um, I don't know that there's anything special about remote versus on site. I think that we try to have the most secure measures we can in either case. So um, I think that we're all treated pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Nick? Yeah, we, we take all of our employees through um, what we call you know, personal security training um, when they join the company. And then there's you know, yeah. continuous education along the way. But it covers everything from their own home office mm -hmm. security, you know, how to secure their house, um, you know, how to secure you know, the, the mail that they receive and all, all sorts of things through that. Um, how to how to you know, remove yourself from from online exposure? Um, we train people in, in how to do that, um, and then um, you know similarly to to your, you know most of our employees are not public facing, and so you know we have over three thousand. But if you were to look on LinkedIn, there's probably like maybe 150 um, wow. that, that show up there, um, and and that's that that's specifically because of the um, the targeted attacks um, that we've seen throughout our our history. Um, that, that, that try to target employees um, because you know, criminals, you know, they, they see employees and, and folks as, as part of the attack surface. Um, just like we, we harden our external attack surface and make sure that the, only the bare minimum is, is listening on the internet or exposed to the internet. You know, we might have tens of thousands of, of systems in our environment, but only a few are actually listening on the internet. Um, we want to have the same model in the physical realm so that our employees won't be targeted and become victims of, of some some physical type of attack. Wow, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, my last question before I have everyone share all their info so everyone can follow them and get in touch with them is kind of like a utopian question. I love hearing people paint a picture of maybe just one or two or three specific use cases that they feel is like the grandest vision of Bitcoin. Like what would be your ideal Bitcoin in the future? Georgi, can we start with you? Bitcoin specifically or just I guess you could choose just <laughs> cryptocurrency in general because there are so you know there's such a variety of use cases um yeah let's let's say any crypto yeah. Yeah, I think the the blockchain itself especially I mean uh I appreciate Bitcoin for what it's done but I think the uh smart contracts and, and what they've done is significantly more powerful um so the blockchain itself rather than the tokens um have a huge potential obviously the tokens are part of the blockchain but the smart contracts can do things that are just ridiculous like it's very difficult to even explain that you can just put money into this contract that just functions on its own and no one has any input like explaining that to someone that's not in tech is, is ridiculously difficult and <laughs> like i've been working on it yeah yeah um, and I've been working on it a lot because I, I need to explain <laughs> our uh, company to people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the smart contracts have this ability to allow financial freedom and take advantage of your money in ways that has never been explored before, like the lending and the liquidity mining, all those things like automated market making, what Uniswap did that doesn't exist anywhere. Um, in stocks, you have, you know, regular market makers and then even on centralized exchange, you have regular market makers, but telling someone that there is a way to hold liquidity on the chain and people can just buy and sell, um, they're just confused. Like how, how does that work? Um, how, what do you mean you don't have a market maker? Um, so it, there's just very unique aspects of, uh, the blockchain and crypto and that comes with the tokens, I guess, uh, every token that's based and utilizing the blockchain is. It's, it's incredible. Great. Jody, what's your most idealistic vision of what cryptocurrency can be in the future? Yeah, I, I think the idea of owning your own data, having your own bank on your phone, having access to capital uh, and information is 
huge. Um, I envision an entire parallel world being built um, in the blockchain, crypto blockchain ecosystem. Uh, you can already start to see every single sector is, is getting replicated in the, in, in the web, the metaverse. Uh, you know, people are buying accessories for avatars with real money using crypto like these crypto shoes actually cost eight hundred dollars or these artworks the uh the nfts i mean these are all of this is real world stuff that's being created in virtual world and you know at some point i guess the question is where is the line between like even reality and the virtual reality it's just becoming extensions of ourselves mm. yeah so extending ourselves it's it's happening whether we like it or not and uh is that the best use of blockchain technology no. I, I ask myself this every day you, know? you think is your phone an extension of yourself totally i'm like an android. yeah and who yeah. owns that data in your phone maybe not me <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's fascinating. Nick, what do you think about um, future idealistic vision of crypto? Yeah, I think about you know, transactions. I think about being able to um, you know, you know, transact with someone you know, any place in the world, or maybe even you know, we're talking about the future. So any place, maybe in the solar system oh, yeah. um, and at, a, at, a, at, a, at a near instant um, capability without um, there being an intermediary um, in the mix. Right. So, so, you know, a good example with, you know, it's early days though, but like, I had my, one of my first experiences in the physical world with lightning um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, we, we, have, we, we allow lightning you know, deposits and withdrawals on our platform, but um, I loaded up my lightning wallet with some, with some Bitcoin and was down at the Bitcoin conference and bought a hat. It was the first time I've actually ever purchased anything in the physical realm with lightning. Um, I bought a hat from the concession, you know, from the, from the swag shop there. And it was, it was really incredible. It was like, like as soon as I, as soon as I scanned the QR code, it was, it was instant. Um, and it, it worked. Um, and it was pretty incredible. Um, and there was nobody in between us. There was not, it didn't have to go through like the traditional payment networks and travel up to, you know, go to an issuer and acquire and visa master. It, it didn't have to do any of that. It literally was instant. Um, and, um, and that was pretty awesome. And so very, still very early days, not, not the best UX, um, in order to load up that lightning wall. But I think, I think in you know, a number of years, something similar to that, you know, instant, you know, you know instant one, you know, person to person type transactions with no one else involved, I think is, um, is pretty, pretty incredible. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's very, that's a very web three vision, because the fascinating thing about web two is being able to do transactions online, but with those, you know, intermediaries. Um, wonderful. Karan, you write our investment newsletter. And I'm wondering, this will definitely be written up in the crypto newsletter. Is a summary of this conversation also going to be in your newsletter? Yeah, so a summary of this will be available in that newsletter as well, in the VC newsletter and the crypto newsletter as well. Oh, right. It's technically the VC, not an... Okay. Thank you for that, Kron. Um, Nick, Jody, Georgi, you guys have been amazing. Extremely high-level stuff. I'm very grateful that you were able to share your time and your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And to Thanks. our audience, we are so grateful to you all for being here. Um, one more really big shout out to our sponsor today, Oryx. We really enjoyed hearing from their co-founder and CEO, Georgi, about their platform. They've helped so many people start investing in crypto. If you want to check them out, it's G-E-T-A-U-R-O-X dot com. Get Oryx. Um, like Karan said, if you subscribe to our newsletters, you're going to see a write-up of this conversation and you're going to see a video replay. So check uh the newsletter for that in the next few days. And of course, go to inside.com to look for our future events. On May 10th, we have an AI event with Sapient X. On May 19th, um, you might be interested in a fractional investments event. And on May 24th and 25th is our very big Meet Our Fund event. We're going to have dozens of venture capital firms speaking to an audience of founders. So again, thank you, audience. Thank you, speakers. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.